Amen. We're going to look today. We're going to continue in the book of John. And we've come to chapter 8. We've come to chapter 8 here. And there's an interesting note there that I don't want to overlook. All right? And maybe you've seen this kind of note in your Bible before. In, in more modern translations, you'll see these kind of notes in there. And it says in brackets, the earliest manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have John chapter 7, verse 53 through 811. A few manuscripts include these verses wholly or in part. After John 736, and it goes on and lists different things, right? But they, so you get this note in there, and I want to address that before we get into the text, all right? And it's important there, and it, this is just a, a free lesson, all right, and thrown in here. But it's important that we understand what they're talking about, because this footnote there, or if, if you have a new NIV, it'll be right up there at the top, right? Before you even read it, you're, you're getting this question, what's this? Is this supposed to be here? Is this scripture? Is this not scripture? Right? And so we see this, and we, again, right away, we start to question, what is this about? So it's important that we understand this, all right? Um, the Gospel of John was written about 90 to 100 A.D., all right? It was the last letter, the last gospel to be written. By this time in history, the faithful Christians have been scattered throughout the Roman Empire, all right? So um, we see that the original copies, like no one had all of it, right? And the churches that received the letters or the epistles, that I'm talking about the letters like of Paul or James, right? The letters, none, no church had all of them, not the original, because they didn't have a copy machine, to send them out, right? Um, they had to be copied carefully, carefully. They were copied by Jewish scribes and so that they could be shared. But because of persecution, because they've scattered, some of them have um, been hidden. Some of them have ended up in private homes, right? Um, we see by 284, uh, yeah, Diocletian, I'm sorry, Diocletian, I can say it without looking, Diocletian, he became emperor of the Roman Empire, and he hated Christianity. He hated Judaism. And so he was so vivid about hating them, he was out to destroy every copy. So then the copies that were spread out became hidden even deeper. It became a thing that they had to be hidden very very deeply, they ended up in homes. They ended up, the originals I'm talking about, ended up places because he was out to destroy the word of God, right? Out to destroy it. It's not until Constantine takes over and Diocletian is dead that we see Constantine was the first Roman emperor to at least uh, be friendly towards the Christianity. And he began to try and out undo what Diocletian had done in wiping out the word of God. He began to search and gather the word of God, right? He began to gather as much as he could there. Um, but they had, it was a struggle because not any church had all of the word of God, right? All of the New Testament there, all of the letters that had been written. And it's not until very recently, in fact, in the last 10 years or so, they discovered um, scriptures that had been smuggled out of the Roman Empire into Alexandria and Egypt. <laughs> they were found in libraries there, original copies, hidden there in Egypt, hidden from Diocletian, hidden from him to preserve them. And it's in those original things those most intact copies that can be found, and I can tell you that John 8, 1 through 11 is there. <laughs> Amen? It's there. And so, and we hear there were um, church leaders, church fathers, if you will, Pope Jerome, St. Augustine, who wrote so much about theology. They wrote so much about church doctrine, and they 
refer to John 8, 1 through 11. They refer to it. Um, they did most of our doctrine, doctrine that we see within the Christian church, within the community of, of believers, right? Um, they talked about this. Some of them, the church leaders who felt um, like Jesus was too easy on this woman caught in adultery. That's where we're going today. Some of them felt that they were too easy on her, and so they refused to preach it. Some priests even cut it out of their scrolls, like, I'm not preaching this. This can't be right. Jesus was too easy on this sin, right? We know that in churches, like we've talked about on Wednesday night in Corinthians, how that they were very, uh, very, very sinful culture. We learned in Corinthians that they would say to act like a Corinthian was to go to see a prostitute. That's how evil they were. And yet Paul took the gospel to them. And so you can see that those that went out to minister there, they said, we're not going to tell them about that. <laughs> we don't want them to take sexual sin lightly. So we're not going to tell them about how easy Jesus was. But as we look at the scriptures today, as we go to the meat of the word, you're going to see here overwhelming love of Christ for the sinner. Right? We're going to look at that. I don't know if you've ever been caught in a sin or not. <laughs> Maybe some of you have been in an impossible, no-win situation Here's where Jesus finds himself today and as we turn to the scriptures here today. So as I said all of that to say this, that the word of God that we have in our laps today is verifiable, is true, right? And we can trust in it, amen? 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is God-breathed, it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right? So I say all that to put your mind at ease, that this is the word of God. Amen? That it has been preserved through time for us. We can trust the word that's been preserved for us. Amen. That note is in there because this Bible was written more than 10 years ago. <laughs> That's why. And they're trying to be completely honest. But now we know. Amen. I think it's time for them to print again. How about you? And get that out of there, right? That it was there. And so God has preserved his word for centuries. He's preserved it for those diocletes that wanted to wipe it out. For all of those that have tried to distort it and um, mar marginalize it, the minds of people, the word of God has been preserved. Amen? And it's our job to preach the word. It's our job to live the word. Amen? So we're going to get into the meat of it now. Amen? Sorry for that distraction there, but I didn't want you all to be sitting there thinking, is this scripture or is it not? Is this inspired or is it not? It is. It is. It's in the Bible, all right? So verse 50, um, no, we're going to go to verse 1 of chapter 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he prepared, he appeared again, I'm sorry, in the temple courts where all the people were gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. 
When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Lord Jesus, as we look into your word today, We need your precious Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that your word is preserved. Lord, your word is eternal. And it has been preserved for us today. Now, Lord, we ask that that same Holy Spirit that breathed these words into being, Lord, would breathe upon us today. Lord, that you would tailor make this word for each of us. For you know exactly where we are and what we're going through. I pray, dear God, you would move upon us, that we would sense your presence and follow your lead, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Caught. Jesus seems to be caught here. Better trapped, right? He's trapped here. He's being trapped here. Scripture tells us very clearly they were trying to trap him. Trap him. What are they trying to trap him about? We're going to look at that this morning, right? The Scripture shows us this, this beautiful picture of grace revealed right here. Grace and forgiveness that Jesus shows to this woman, whether she be whether she deserves it or not, we see God's grace poured out upon her. We also see the extremes that those who are pious and want to look righteous will go to, right? The extremes that they will go to to trap Jesus, right? The first thing we see is the fact that this woman was caught in adultery. I put that in quotes, end quotes, right? Uh, that she's caught in adultery. I got questions about that. Don't you? I got questions about this. Yes. It takes more than one person to commit adultery, <laughs> right? And he was to be brought too, but how is she caught? Like, did the Pharisees just happen to be walking by this house and they hear noise of passion and they look in to see? Like, how is this? And then they get this bright idea. Let's go to Jesus and let's, let's trap him here. Like, I mean, there's a lot of questions going on here. Like, how did this come about? <laughs> we know her husband didn't turn on her. Because according to the scriptures, if the husband was to bring her, (laughs) he'd be the first one with the rock in his hand to do her in. So I think we can assume from that that she doesn't have a husband. I think she's single. (laughs) So it must have been the man that was married, right? Because adultery... According to scriptures, what that means is it's involving sexual sin where at least one party is married under a covenant with someone else, right? And so it must be the man that was married to somebody else. Was it all part of a plan? I got questions. I got questions about this. This isn't quite right. Should have been two people coming there, right? So we get the impression she's not married at all because there's no husband there to accuse her or to throw the first stone. She's probably a loose woman, if you would call her that. (laughs) She may have been a prostitute. She may have made her living that way. We don't know, but um, how they found her is beyond us, right? We don't know. (laughs) 
Very likely she's been this way for years. Very likely she's had a reputation. So they said, well, let's just take her. Jezebel, I don't know, whatever her name is. <laughs> let's take her. Yeah, I just made that up. You won't find it in Scripture. <laughs> I just gave her a name. Yeah, but they bring her to Jesus there. The interesting thing is if they knew this woman's reputation, why didn't they try to help her out of this lifestyle? All they see is a sin, and they want to trap Jesus for his judgment. Always trying to trap Jesus. Is adultery wrong? Yes, it is. We see that in the scriptures. It is wrong. But Jesus looks at this woman and he sees a woman desperately in need. In need of true love. In need of true grace. How many are saved by grace? <laughs> Me. Yeah. Right? It's likely that this woman has never known true love or true grace. Her whole worldview of men revolves how she's been treated, used and abused, left as soon as their selfish needs were met, they were out of there. People deserve respect. People deserve God's love because they're created in his image, right? Now, I could go all into the evils of pornography and, and adultery and fornication, which is sexual sin between those that aren't married, aren't entangled in a marriage license, right? But I'm not going to today. I want you, you know that. You search the scriptures, you know what sin is. We need to, as believers, set our eyes upon what is good. Like David, I'll put no unclean thing before me. We all have to guard that, that we don't use people, whether it's sexually or whatever, that we do not use people, but that we view them in the image of God that they were created. This woman in John 8 is a victim of selfish men as much as she's an evil woman that caused men to sin. Right? The biggest reasons I think that Jesus shows her mercy is she is a victim of what's been done, of the life that she's led, right? If anyone could have picked up a rock and been justified to do so, it was Jesus. <laughs> For we'll see in a, a few short months that he will die on the cross for her sin and our sin. Amen? He will die there. And he, he is the only one in this crowd that is able to pick up a rock because he was without sin, but he chooses not to. The grace of and the forgiveness of Jesus is very evident here. But we see here that the Jewish leaders, they're not trying to rid their society of evil, <laughs> this blight of sin that has come upon them. They're out to trap Jesus. Now, what do I mean by that? We're going to look at that, right? Because Jesus shows the mercy, but he, they're out to trap him to discredit him in his ministry. That's their goal, right? They're, he wants to give, they want to give the Roman authorities the right to kill them, the information that they need there. It's a trap. It's a trap. It says there in verse 4, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. But what do you say? They were using this question as a trap, Scripture tells us, in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now, we're not sure if there was a committee set up to come up with this plan. All right, let's do this. Jesus is teaching, so let's go and let's find this woman and let's bring her to Jesus and just see what he says. Because it's a no-win 
situation here that they're putting Jesus in. They want a grounds to accuse him either of heresy, not standing for the word of God, right? Or to turn him into the Roman authorities. This is the trap they're setting before him, right? That's what they're trying to do. Yep, it's a trap, it's a trap. My kids said you would know what that is. It's Star Wars, I think, right? <laughs> Under Roman law, a person couldn't be put to death unless they went through a Roman court, right? So that so for Jesus to say, let's follow the law, let's stone her according to the law of Moses, he would be in violation of the Roman rule, the Roman law. You see, this is a trap. If he agreed, if Jesus said, okay, she was caught in adultery, that's it, let's stone her, then they could in turn, have gone to the authorities because they're under Roman oppression here. The Romans have taken over. And they, you remember when Jesus was going to be crucified and, and Pilate said, should I release to you Barabbas who led an insurrection? And what was his punishment going to be? Crucifixion, right? So it was worthy of crucifixion to be insurrected, to go against the laws of the Roman people. Right? And so the Pharisees could have gone right to Pilate. Pilate could have ordered him to be crucified right there. Because she wasn't found guilty in a Roman court of law. Right? So he would be guilty and worthy of crucifixion. That's coming. But in God's timing, not man's. Right? The second scenario was that if Jesus simply forgives the woman... Then what? He'd be violating the Old Testament law, which God had himself given to his people, that a woman caught in sin, a man caught in sin like that, adultery should be stoned. That was God, his father's law. Then they could say, he's a heretic. He doesn't support God's word. How could he be our Messiah? You see what I'm saying? It was a no-win situation. Have you ever been in a no-win situation? I think we've all been there. <laughs> if I do this, then I can get in trouble there. If I do this, then I can get in trouble there. Jesus is in this situation. If he stands with the law and demands justice that this woman must die, even though it's very questionable, the situation surrounding it, right? then he could be guilty under Roman law. If he just forgives her, he's guilty under Jewish law, the law of God, the law of Moses, right? First response that Jesus gives is silence. He doesn't say anything. There's a lesson for us there. <laughs> you ever bite your tongue? <laughs> There's a lesson there for us that's good instruction for us there is initial silence. <laughs> Life has a way of throwing things, no-win situations at us. We can be accused of things that are so outrageous, <laughs> and yet they get start getting spread as truth, right? Our first reaction, this urge that we have <laughs> that rises up within us is to defend ourselves. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> that's not how I said that. That's right. That's our first reaction. It's like this starts coming, 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 right? And our first reaction is to try and prove our innocence. When sometimes the most spiritual thing that we could do is to be quiet. That's a hard thing to do, right? That's self-control of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's a 
of the Spirit, self-control, right? To stay silent and not speak. Let the Lord fight those battles. Let the Lord fight those battles. The word may go around. The word may be false. It's going around, but people will come to their senses if we let the Lord fight those battles. Mm, it's a lesson there. Then the Bible says that he bent down and he wrote on the de- in the dust on the ground. <laughs> Many books have been written about what he wrote in the ground. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't what he wrote. I've heard everything from it could have been names. Susie Q. Could have been dates. Summer of 52. Could have been, right? We don't know. Could have been places. Camp of this. Camp of that. I don't know. (laughs) Oh, no. I don't know. Some people say he was writing down the law of Moses, writing down those Ten Commandments. Maybe he was writing from Exodus there, Exodus 20. Thou shalt not commit adultery. (laughs) Maybe he was reading another one. Thou shalt not covet another man's wife. What he was writing about. They were accusing this woman. Jesus bent down to write. Maybe he was writing, put no unclean thing before your eyes. They had to see what was going on to bring her in. They didn't say, oh, it looks like it's going up to adultery. (laughs) They said she was caught in the very act. Were they watching? That's a sin. I will set no unclean thing before my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, and they kept asking him. He was just writing. He said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. It says something interesting there. That's why I think it was something specific. Because it said from the oldest to the youngest, they left. Names, dates, places, sin. I think that would be fitting to know that Jesus, the Son of God, knew. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Probably not their names, like (laughs) Jacob and somebody this day. No. No. But they just quietly left. The accusers left. Oldest to youngest, Jesus knew. He knew their ages. He knew the sins on their account. Hmm. We don't know what he wrote, but it was powerful. (laughs) It was powerful. And I believe that (laughs) the conviction of God was being poured out on them. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And the oldest left first, and then the next oldest, and the next oldest, and the next oldest. If there's anything that age does <laughs> for us, it should make us humbler. <laughs> Not only do we realize that beauty is fleeting, 
I don't know who this old lady is that looks in the mirror at me every day. <laughs> I don't know what happened to this woman. <laughs> but it should change us, right? We talked on Wednesday night about the closer we get to God, the more we realize has to go, right? And so as we mature in the Lord, we should realize that we're not there yet, <laughs> right? We're not there yet, that God's not finished with us yet. It should hum us. <laughs> we looked at the graduates today. How many of you wish you were that age, and would you go back and give yourself a stern talking to? Some of you would really... um. Put yourself upside the head. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> right? Because we know things now that we didn't know then. Right? The oldest to youngest they leave. <laughs> the longer we walk with God, the more we should be humbled. <laughs> right? The more we elevate Jesus in our lives, the less we see ourselves, the more we see him. That's a recipe for humility. Humility is the destroyer of pride. <laughs> it is. Let's to the next point here. He says, he who is without sin. Jesus has a statement about judging others. says, he who is without sin. All the fights, all the discord in families, in churches, <laughs> in neighborhoods, in cities, and in nations, all that discord comes from the, the false impression that we know better. That's a pride, right? We know better. You're right and you're wrong because we know better. Trouble comes from that. We know better. <laughs> we are better, right? Yeah. Jesus isn't necessarily saying here that you can't judge others. We see in Matthew 7 on the Sermon of the Mount, in verse 1, it says, Do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank <laughs> in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, <laughs> when all the time there's a plank in your own? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I think that most Christians, most churches, most denominations, I dare say, fall into two camps because we're not very good at middle of the road. <laughs> we fall into two camps. Either we're extreme legalists, your hair has to be to here, your dress has to be to there, your sleeves have to be to here, right? Yeah. Extreme legalists. You know people like that? I know people like that. Very legalistic. And they like to point out your every single flaw. <laughs> oh, no, 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 right? Hands. They like to pick at you. Shorts, right? Oh, red nail polish. Oh, dear. <laughs> right? They like to point out every single fault in you. Like, that's one camp. The other camp goes too far the other extreme in that they're, they never preach on sin. They never tell you what sin is. You're never convicted and you never repent because you don't even know what sin is. God loves everybody. 
There's two camps there, right? And both of them are very dangerous. What does the word of God say? Right? He pitied the people in both camps. <laughs> Some are pushing people away by the thousand because they can't live up to that. And other people are, are coming and into it, but they never repent of their sin because they never realize it is sin. Both are very wrong. But Jesus shows us the correct way right here. Right here in this precious part of Scripture, he shows us the great love. The greatest love we can show for brothers and sisters in Christ, for the lost that are around us, right, is to gently guide them to the way of righteousness. Gently. Drew has an Aussie, an Australian shepherd at our house. Sweet, sweet puppy dog, right? Sweet. He ha yeah, until you knock on the door, right? I'm sorry about that. Come in and sit down and he'll lick your face, right? But, yeah. But we had to teach him to be gentle when we were going to give him a treat, right? Because he wanted to hold it. Gentle, gentle. I said we need to show the love gently and guide them gently to the way that God has for them, right? We're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we're told, convicts us of sin, right? We can tell the truth. Of the Bible says this is sin. That We can do that, but we gently, gentle, thinly, gently, we gently lead them to the way of righteousness, right? We're not saying there is no sin. There is sin, and we must avoid it, right? But gently guiding them in the way of righteousness. The Pharisees were legalists. They were extreme over here. They could spot sin a mile away. They could spot, oh, that's against the law. That's against the law. That's against the law. But they weren't winning converts, were they? Right? We show them sin, and we gently lead them. How do we lead them? By example, right? By example, we have to lead them. The Pharisees thought they were better than everyone else. Lord, help us. We are not better than anyone else. We're saved by grace. Amen? We didn't earn it. We weren't rich enough. We weren't smart enough. We weren't pretty enough. We are here by grace. God's grace, we gently take it. We gently give it. Amen. They didn't look at this woman and say, this poor woman, she's been used and abused. Was she in a sinful life? Yes, she was. But look at her situation. I think Jesus knew the truth of her situation there. Jesus wants us to see people through his eyes, not our eyes, through his eyes. We have those people that we look at and secretly think, wow, they're a mess. We may even think, I'm better than them. I'm better than them. Lord, help us. We're not. But the grace of God, there go I. We look at these people, and we're quick to think that's wrong, man. They are messed up. They are so messed up on drugs, they can't take care of their kids. They're this, they're that, right? We look at them, and that is not how God wants us to see people. People are valuable to the Lord. How do I know that? Because the Bible says for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the most precious thing that he had, he gave for us. That means we're worth something. All of us, all of them, we're worth something because the precious blood of Jesus was shed for our sins. So they are worth God's love. They are worth God's forgiveness. They are worth God's grace. 
we look at them all, but pastor, they, they cuss like a sailor. They drink like a sponge, right? <laughs> They're so high, they don't know anything. Does it matter? God said they're worth the death of his son. We got to get a hold of that. We're not better than them. We started out like them, a sinner, lost, away from God, and God wants us. He wants us. He desires us. He desires them. Jesus looked at this poor woman. They're left one by one. He says, who condemns you? No one. Neither do I, Jesus said. Neither do I. And then he adds something there that some of those uh, ancient fathers didn't see. He said, leave your life of sin. Leave your life of sin. You didn't break either one of the laws. You had God's heart in the matter, right? True repentance is to turn from sin. Romans 6 says, should we go on sinning so that grace can abound? No. <laughs> no, right? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He set us free. He's given us his grace. He's given us his forgiveness, and it's all free. It's all free, but he wants all of us. Amen? He wants all of us. Go and leave your life of sin. That's what Christ said to her. That's what he says to us. None of us who have come to Christ, we've all come like this woman in terror and fear for our very lives becomes we come dirty with the sin of this world. Yet we come to the foot of the cross. We humble ourselves and we say, Lord, forgive me for I have sinned. Forgive me. And we see God's grace. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Why could he say that? Because he's going to pay the price for the sin. Amen. He's going to pay the price. We need to accept Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior, right? Believe that he's the only way to heaven. That's it. That only way. Confess our sin before him. We don't have to confess it before a person. Thank goodness. We can confess it to God. We must confess it. We got to repent. We got to turn from that and live a life pleasing to the Lord. We need that's a good reminder of grace and forgiveness, right? From God's hand. Amen. You've been very patient. I feel the humidity just drying in my heart. Thank you, Father. You've been good. Stand with me as we close. It's so important that we embrace the gospel message, right? We're sinners saved by grace. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. By the grace of the Lord Jesus. And that we not only believe it, but that we share it. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we turn our hearts to you, we believe you are the Son of God. We believe you are the way. We believe you died on the cross for our sins. Help us, O oh Lord, to realize, to appreciate the forgiveness we found in you. Help us, O oh Lord, to walk in newness of life, leaving our sin behind, I pray. Stir our hearts, God, as we endeavor this week and the weeks to come, Lord, to reach out to the lost. May we do it gently, I pray. May we share a story, O oh Lord, of our sins forgiven and theirs can be too. Lord, move in our hearts, I pray. May we be your church, Lord, busy about your business, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. God bless you.